Hello, my name is Stephen Visco. I am the CEO and CTO of Polypose Battery Company. Uh, it's my pleasure to be part of the 64th Annual SVC uh, Virtual Technical Conference. And today I'll be talking to you about some of the challenges and strengths of solid state battery technology. So many of you have probably seen headlines like you see here, uh, which predicts the death of the internal combustion engine. That might be a bit hyperbolic, but uh, the fact of the matter is there have been some pretty strong statements issued by a number of uh, large car companies. General Motors plans to eliminate gasoline and diesel light duty cars and S uh, SUVs by 2035. Uh, Volvo is going down the, the same. They, they actually want to have their entire lineup electric by 2030. So this is a very, very significant shift in how uh, automotives are powered. And um, there are some issues. There are obviously some concerns. Uh, here you see a, a fire uh, of an electric vehicle that took place um, in uh, Davies, Florida. This is the kind of thing um, that battery manufacturers are certainly worried about and car companies as well. So as we move toward more advanced battery systems, Really, the big question is how do we uh, push the technology, develop uh, next generation batteries with even higher energy density, but how do we do that without compromising safety? Well, if we're going to move in this direction, uh, it's almost certainly going to be a lithium-based technology, lithium metal. Now, why would we do that? Why would you move to lithium? Um, actually, in this very simple table, uh, particularly focusing on the bottom part of the table, you'll see that uh, the energy density or the capacity density of batteries based on lithium uh, relative to, say, carbon are much, uh, much higher energy density systems. So lithium is four times the volumetric capacity density and 10 times the gravimetric capacity density relative to carbon. So this allows you then to boost the performance of uh, of the battery if you make this shift. And here you see um, kind of the, the increase in energy density uh, in yellow here as you move from carbon to lithium metal, and it's quite, quite significant. So you, you're looking at uh, watt hour per liter values uh, upwards of, you know, 1,400 watt hours per liter, and on the gravimetric side, uh, you know, uh, over 500 watt hours per kilogram if we go fully solid state. So that's, that's significant. Um, and of course, a lot of that is due to the replacement of carbon by lithium, but there are other things that they're involved in here as well. So let's look at uh, solid state. Let's look at solid state batteries, uh, some of the positives and negatives uh, as we kind of make this transition. So um, if we build a solid state battery, uh, the big shift here is to a solid electrolyte. Uh, largely the anodes and cathodes are already solid, so we're eliminating the liquid, electro elect uh, liquid electrolyte as we do this. If we look at vehicle electrification, just in terms of IP, um, you'll see in the last 20 years the number of granted patents in the field has soared by 800%. And in fact, uh, if you look at priority filings, for solid state versus liquid, you'll see that solid state has been kind of the dominant area uh, for uh, intellectual property. So there's clearly a lot of interest, a lot is happening in this field. So let's kind of flesh this out. Um, we can conceptually build a solid state cell, you know, look at what's involved in building a solid state cell. And so uh, like any battery, there's gonna be a cathode of the positive electrode. Typically, those cathodes are going to be uh, comprised of uh, lithium cobalt oxide, NMC, other uh, possibilities. And then that has to have a solid electrolyte blended in with it. This is tricky. Um, and then, of course, there's a solid electrolyte separator. It may well be the same material that's in the cathode, the composite. And then you introduce lithium metal. Well, in the cathode, um, you have a large number of solid, solid contacts uh, and interfaces, and those have to be maintained with cycling. So, you know, when you cycle, there are volumetric changes that introduces mechanical stresses that can cause disconnection of those interfaces, and that would be manifested as a resistance rise and loss of capacity. So that is tricky. Um, and on the lithium side, uh, it just by going to solid state does not guarantee that you won't have dendrites. Dendrites um, are these needle-like projections that penetrate the, penetrate the electrolyte and can lead to a direct short circuit, 
and you know a failure of the battery so we certainly don't want that so all of these issues have to be addressed let's look at some of the pros then in going solid state uh, a number of solid electrolytes are single ion conductors, which are great. Yeah, that's great. Liquid electrolytes are not. They have both ions uh, moving, migrating. Um, solid electrolytes are non-volatile, no leaking, uh, typically non-flammable. Uh, this should lead to increased safety and may permit the use of lithium metal uh, without the, you know, the formation of dendrites. Uh, if, it's, if it's the appropriate solid electrolyte, it should stop dendrites. So that means it's possible to build a fully solid state battery, but with some of these caveats. Cons, um, so most solid electrolytes, sulfides and oxides, have lower ionic conductivity than liquid electrolytes. Not always true, but uh, quite often that is the case. Polymer electrolytes are not sufficiently conductive at room temperature. So most polymer electrolytes uh, or solid uh, state batteries using polymer electrolytes have to be operated at high temperature, maybe 80 centigrade, unless you add liquid. But if you add liquid, you know, really what you have is something like this, um, a gel. Uh, so yeah, as you can see, that's not truly solid state, right? These are solid-ish materials, but you can imagine dendrites can push through that type of a structure very easily. So that's really not the appropriate approach. However, um, if you look at ceramics as solid electrolytes, scaling is an issue. Scaling uh, thin ceramic films is difficult. Um, cost of raw materials, depending on your choice of solid electrolyte, can be high. Uh, and manufacturing costs can be high, again, depending. Uh, we'll look at that. And then, of course, if it's a ceramic, you worry about brittle fracture. So what are your choices? The choices are polymer electrolytes. Uh, again, uh, the advantage with polymers is high speed roll through roll manufacturing. Um, is, you know, plastic sheet uh, can be manufactured at very low cost and polymer electrolytes are no different. This can be a low cost approach. Polycrystalline ceramics, uh, there's an issue there. Uh, that's actually a scanning electron microscope image of a uh, a sintered zirconia plate. Um, when you're looking at ceramic materials, you're going to be introducing lithium. You can't have any pinholes, and getting to a structure like that is not trivial. And then glasses. Um, glasses, of course, can be produced in bulk. These are actually very large sculptures made by Schott um, in Duryea, Pennsylvania. But really what we're talking about here is ultra-thin glass. And that, again, is high-speed roll-to-roll manufacturing, and it, it's starting to mirror uh, the way you make uh, polymeric separators. So there's some kind of interesting approaches there. All right, let's look at polymer electrolytes. You know, the, the father of, of polymer electrolytes uh, and polymer batteries is Michel Armand. And you can see here uh, he was talking about this quite early. Uh, this You see a, a schematic of a solid-state battery based on polymer electrolytes. Uh, polymer electrolytes are, are, are mostly uh, PEO type electrolytes. You can see the ether oxygen linkages in these polymers um, and they uh, solvate lithium ions allowing lithium to move through the polymer in a kind of segmental motion. Uh, the problem of course is that these are conductive but again they fall off pretty rapidly. Uh, as you approach room temperature, so they're not appropriate for room temperature batteries. So these have to be higher temperature batteries. Uh, again, the advantage of polymers, though, is that you know you have this high-speed roll-to-roll processing, so you can uh, you should be able to reach parity with lithium-ion, and that's certainly an advantage. There have been companies that have commercialized room temperature polymer electrolyte batteries, but they took the approach I mentioned earlier. Uh, so they address this issue of how do you get to room temperature if you have a, a polymeric electrolyte? Well, they, they added liquid, effectively uh, making a gel. So you kind of have a sponge with, uh, with liquid electrolyte in that sponge. Uh, Danionics actually did this, licensed it to me, that it in fact went to Valence. Uh, this was in the 90s. And um, they had a $100 million deal with Motorola for cell phone batteries. The problem was when they shipped the batteries, uh, and they tested them, they burned. And so that was the end of valence. So this approach of adding liquid to a polymer and calling it a solid state battery doesn't really work. You don't get the safety advantages that you would hope for. 
But there are companies that are doing it right. Um, Bolloré in France commercialized a true uh, solid polymer battery for electric vehicles. They call it the blue car. And I think it's doing okay. I don't think there have been any big safety issues. The problem, of course, here is that uh, it has to operate at high temperature. Okay, so if we look at the kind of universe of solid electrolytes for rechargeable lithium metal, then it looks something like this. On the one side, you have crystalline and polycrystalline materials, oxides, sulfides, things like garnet, LLZO, LATP, LGPS. Uh, and then there are non crystalline materials, which would be polymers and glasses. If you look at a chart of density for a variety of materials, you will see, though, um, so polymers are, are actually low density, which is good because that means they don't weigh much. Um, it's just a passive component in the battery. You don't want it to weigh much. The problem with some of these ceramics, like LLZO, they're very dense, which means they're very heavy. So that's kind of an issue. Um, you also want them to be strong enough to blunt dendrites. Um, so this kind of uh, shear modulus requirement, uh, which was uh, talked about by Monroe and Newman, in a famous model, uh, is a necessary but not sufficient condition. Um, when you think about ceramics, you don't typically think about you know, flexible materials as you do with polymers. But in reality, if they're thin enough, they can be flexible. Here you see uh, a zirconia membrane. Uh, and on the lower right, you see a 20 micron zirconia membrane made by our, our energy. Uh, this was licensed uh, to energy from Corning. Um, and you can see how flexible that ceramic is. The problem is, um, this is not a simple process. Uh, it's an expensive process. So it involves uh, tape casting of a slurry uh, to make a green tape. And then those green tapes are typically laminated to form a uh, laminate structure. And then that has to go through sintering. And as I said, you not only want to close all the pinholes, but you want this to be flat. There are other issues, too. Um, some work that was done at Polyplus and by others, cycling of lithium metal through uh, garnet. You can, in fact, see lithium dendrites penetra penetrating this dense solid electrolyte uh, through uh, and along the grain boundaries. Now, some companies have claimed they've solved that problem, but the pricing uh, problem may still be a big issue. Um, if you just look at the retail pricing of globally scaled thin, thin ceramic sheet, you'll see like something simple like alumina, 200 microns, is about $1,000 a square meter. That's very expensive. Polymers are dollars per square meter. Uh, this ultra thin 40 micron uh, thick ceramic, that's in the range of $5,000 a square meter. So that's well out of the range of what would be practical for an EV. So now we can look at another type of solid state battery, um, which is actually called a micro battery, and it is done through sputter deposition. So you have a substrate, you have a sputter target, uh, you may sputter down the cathode and then sputter down the solid electrolyte and evaporate lithium on top of that. Uh, the beauty of the glass is that no voids or grain boundaries. And then um, that allows you to build cells that look something like this. This is a commercial cell which had a commercial spec of 10,000 cycles at 100% depth of discharge. So this is desirable, obviously, but these are also expensive batteries because sputter deposition is slow and capital intensive. So that's not what you want to do. But there is something here, which is the use of glass electrolytes that's interesting. So Polyplus is you know, working in this area of glass electrolytes. So the idea is to use high conductivity sulfides, actually, um, which can be processed through melt processing, uh, high-speed manufacturing techniques that are used to make display materials. Uh, so the iPhone or uh, you know smartphones all have a thin uh, glass membrane sitting on top, which is quite inexpensive. Um, computer displays, uh, large uh, TVs also have thin glass displays. And when you get down to the kind of thicknesses we're talking about, uh, glasses become quite flexible, almost like polymers. You can see here about a 50 micron sheet of glass being handled very much like a piece of plastic. So uh, if you look at pricing on glass, a very different situation. Here's Gorilla Glass, $40 a square meter for a 100-piece order. Uh, Willow Glass, also inexpensive, $8 a square meter. Uh, and look at the smoothness, the roughness, should I say, is less than 0 0.5 nanometers. So you can get to this kind of fidelity uh, at low cost. 
And in uh, China, you can get thin sheet glass for about a dollar square meter. So as I mentioned, we're working at Polyplus with sulfides. You can see here, this is a 70 millimeter uh, piece of glass that was actually pressed above the softening point. Uh, it's about 400 microns thick. And it's very conductive. You can see here the ionic conductivity as a function of temperature. So at room temperature is 10 to the minus 3 Siemens per centimeter, which is quite high. Um, we've also looked at the mechanical properties of, our, of these glasses. The glass that we're working with is close to the mechanical strength of oxide glasses and much higher than most of these kind of uh, solid electrolytes. So it's more than tough enough to block lithium dendrites. And in fact, when we test it, and we test it in these uh, small working cells, um, you can see that the charge discharge cycles lay right on top of one another. We don't see any kind of degradation over time. And in fact, if we cycle a uh, 400 micron thick membrane, you can see here that at a variety of current densities, very reversible cycling. So in fact, the glasses are quite good at, at uh, keeping lithium uh, in order so that it doesn't form dendrites and is reversibly cycled. Polypos is working with SK, a Korean company, uh, on next generation battery technology. And this is kind of a view of what the ultimate battery will look like. Uh, it's based on, again, on thin sheet glass, 20 to 30 microns, uh, a little bit of lithium to get the, that to initiate uh, the kind of charging, and then a conventional metal oxide cathode. The process for making thin glass looks something like this. You start with an ingot of glass that is then pressed out into a preform. The preform goes into a draw tower. Draw towers are known in kind of fiber optics. Uh, that's how you draw an optical fiber. Um, and then we have a Kurt Lesker system for depositing lithium, and ultimately we will move toward building pouch cells. So uh, inside that draw tower, basically we start with a preform, uh, a block of high conductivity uh, sulfide glass. It goes through that draw tower, it comes out the other side as thin glass. And I can show you some of the preliminary data on drawing glass. We've, we've been drawing glass now for just a, about a month. And you can see that we can draw uh, 60 micron glass. Um, and even more impressively, uh, we have drawn glass as thin as 15 microns. So this is as thinner, maybe thinner than polymeric separators and much stronger, right? And this is, again, a single line conductor. So here you see the uh, PVD system we have. We can evaporate uh, lithium onto uh, our sulfide glass. And one of the things we do when uh, we're calibrating the system is actually uh, simply to evaporate lithium onto copper substrates and then uh, strip the lithium off the copper to just see how reproducible this evaporation step is. And you can see here it's quite reproducible. Depending on time uh, and temperature that you're evaporating at, we get very good reproducibility. This is several microns of lithium on the left and a couple of microns on lithium on the right. And we electrochemically strip it to... Uh, to actually uh, ensure that we have the lithium we think we have there. So commercialization is going to look something like this. We will uh, produce as a product uh, lithium metal on thin sheet glass, which we're producing in the draw tower. And then that ultimately allows us to build batteries such as this, where we have a very large jump in both gravimetric and volumetric energy density. And this course, as I mentioned, will be a safe system. That allows us to pursue a variety of commercial markets, starting with maybe drones, moving into consumer electronics, and ultimately EVs, which means, of course, in the long term, we have to be at parity with lithium ion cost, but we have a tremendous advantage on um, performance. And that is the end of the talk.